Okay, so does anybody have any questions before we start? We're going to do a little bit more on regulation and then get into our scows and discussion is my plan. So um, today I want to talk about camels. Uh, secrets. <laughs> the thing that bank examiners bring into audits. So, bank examiners bring camels. Yeah, they are heavy smoker. Uh, yes. Bank examiners bring camels to audit. Um, so we've got um, three agencies uh, that do bank examinations, and they share information with each other so that they're not double dipping, even if their jurisdictions kind of overlap a little bit in different cases. So um, we've got three. Uh, Three government agencies that do audits of lending institutions or of banks. I guess we're really talking about the banks here. Uh, number one is the comptroller of the currency. They handle big national banks. Comptroller, yep. That's kind of the uh, head guru in charge of accounting, basically, and books. Was that a fair statement, Chelsea? Have you heard that in other? Yeah. I mean, I, I read it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a title. Yeah. It, it's a position, and it's usually the top position. Like, you are the head of, if you're the comptroller of the organization, then you're the one that's ultimately at the top. Or right. Yeah. I mean, they're all right. The of, of that kind of record keeping financial function. Okay, so they're the, uh, con that's uh, the one agency. Number two is the Fed, our beloved Fed, the central bank. Um, they do the auditing for member state banks member state banks. What's the difference between a state bank and a national bank? It's just where they can do business. So a state bank, you can get your charter in Kansas and you can't do banking in any other state. So I ran into this problem actually when I moved from Iowa. Um, I had a, a couple rental properties where I was still getting some deposits coming uh, uh, to me from them. And I thought, oh, no big deal, I'll just go drop it in the ATM. Well, it turns out you can't do that. So you can't put money into the ATM here in Kansas for a bank that doesn't have a charter in Kansas. So the bank I was banking at was an Iowa chartered bank, a state bank, and so you couldn't use an ATM anymore. Whereas a Wells Fargo has a national charter, and you, they, so that their charter covers anywhere in the United States. So it's just how, what what kind of territory they they can cover, and obviously the big the, those big banks are covering um, a lot more territory. So the type of rules they place, they might be a little more specialized uh, within states. Makes sense maybe to have the Fed doing that since the Fed has the 12 Federal Reserve banks, and that's been kind of their thing all along is they have regional spots so that they can handle uh, banks in different states. All right, and then finally the FDIC, who we've talked about earlier, um, they take up the uh, insured non-member banks. So they're insured through the FDIC, which is pretty much all of them. I don't know if there is any that don't, but insured non-member um, banks, state banks. Okay, so these three groups 
um, share information. Again, as you, as you know, the Fed has some jurisdiction over all banks that are members of the Federal Reserve. So um, there's shared thing, but for auditing, they share audit info. <clears throat> and they also follow the same CAMELS practices that we'll get into in a sec. They share audit info so that one bank doesn't have the Fed coming in one week and then two months later they're facing the FDIC coming in. They're just going to follow the same type of audit process as they, as they go through. They do have folks, I mean, sometimes they bring, like, the Fed might bring FDIC folks. Oh, bring a... Uh, extra person along or for whatever reason, okay. Um, so, camels. So, camels is an acronym, acronym. and capital adequacy as the first one. We watched the video, we talked a little bit about it, what does that mean? Because that, that's a biggie. That actually kind of summarizes a lot of these other things. What was capital, bank capital, bank capital adequacy? And enough in reserves to cover themselves in case certain loans uh, were default. Okay. And how do you <coughs> calculate somebody other than John bank capital? Assets minus liability, yep. Back to that balance sheet equation that we started this off with. We, I think when we did the very first day, we started this chapter of uh, reviewing the balance sheet from uh, the previous chapter, which we actually weren't covering, but the ba basic bank balance sheet. Okay, <clears throat> so that brings us into one part of the balance sheet. The A is asset quality. So that ties into capital adequacy but in a different way. What would asset quality, first of all, what are those bank assets? What's the primary asset of the bank? Loans. loans, right? So the loans that they have on the books are their assets. And so from a capital standpoint, pure numbers of 10 million minus uh, 9 million of liabilities gives us a million dollars bank capital. 10 minus 9 equals 1, I've got $1 million of capital. But that $1 million position in capital could be shaky or it could be rock solid depending on the quality of the asset. So what is this speaking to? Okay, good. So how good those loans are maybe in terms of default risk. So if you've got a bunch of uh, real estate developers that are pushing the edge, that are highly leveraged, and that's pretty much your whole portfolio of loans is all speculation, co new construction homes, new spec homes. If that's your whole portfolio, then your asset quality is running a little bit more on the risky position, might not be quite as, quite as solid. All right, good. So then uh, management is the M. And this, this really speaks to kind of the uh, internal controls get evaluated at the bank. What sort of uh, things are you doing to manage your flows of, of money? Um, so they, assi <coughs> they assign a risk rating, a risk management rating, which in part is driven so you get like kind of a one to five in a number of categories and so they kind of give you a ranking of do you have things in place at your bank that act as control measures through the management of your uh, money the e is earnings how does the bank make money there's various sources of revenue. What are some sources of earnings? Deposits. So deposits represent a outflow cash or an inflow? Inflow. Outflow, right? Deposits come in, but the earnings as far as the how much money we made, 
That's our flow variable with the interest we paid out on deposits. So what's that offset with? So really that, that is kind of the expense on the books. What's the earnings or the positive revenue, the interest from those loans that we have? So we got assets that are earning maybe 7% on average and we've got deposits flowing out at 3%, we have a 4% spread, right? So that's part of how we make money. How else do banks make money? Fees, right? All the late fees and uh, safe deposits, okay? Uh, do they ever hold bonds? They can, right? So they can hold corporate bonds or, or a, it's a small part of their portfolio, but they could have uh, U.S. government securities coming in, so they could have interest received from those sorts of, um, that sort of thing. So all of that plays into earnings and, and where they um, come in from, the sources. Liquidity. Liquidity. Okay, so liquidity, what are we talking there? How you're able to use, like, exchanges for cash. Exchanges for cash, yeah. So if you're holding a U.S. government bond, that's a lot more liquid than that real estate loan we were talking about, right, as far as turning it into cash. If you had to sell a million dollars worth of government bonds versus a million dollar loan that you have with a real estate developer out there, those are both assets. So again, on our balance sheet, they're gonna show up on the asset side and contribute to the overall financial picture, but the US government bonds are much more liquid, ability to cash them in and get into hard-earned cash. All right, and then that S is sensitivity to market risk. That last video we watched kind of spoke to that as part of the camel's test. What, what was the test that the, they brought up in that video? It had a little bucket and stress the test. stress test. Yeah, so they, they kind of do a computer simulation of your bank. Like, here's your assets, here's your liabilities, here's how many, here's your earnings, here's your US balance of uh, asset quality, here's this, here's that. We kind of look at the overall picture and then we allow a computer model to say, suppose this type of negative event happens. How long, what will your bank look like 30 days from now if the crap hits the fan, right? That stress test. And so then they get rated on how well they pass that test. So that's one thing um, that they might do um, under this category, so the stress test. All right, so um, so that kind of gives us a, a quick overview of the types of things the regulators might have in mind when they come for a little visit. And I always remember I'd always get uh, calls from my bankers because I had lots of loans out to lots of different banks. And they're like, oh, Russ, could, we, could you get that? Uh, we need an updated financial statement for this particular LLC you got, and it's been a year now, and they're kind of required, and it's probably part of the fine print that I never read on some of the mortgage documents that says that I, I agree to provide a, a personal financial statement and also a, a financial statement of the, of the entity that had the loan in its name. And so uh, they might check our files, and they literally will come in and kind of randomly select files. And so... The bankers are kind of scurrying if they get an announcement. By the way, a lot of times it's unannounced visit too, so it might depend on. Uh, every once in a while, they like to pop an unannounced visit while they'll just drop into the bank. Hi, we'd like to check out your file drawer over there. And so they open up. In the old days, more so, it would open up a file drawer, and there's still a paper files as well. And they'd say, "Hmm, let's pick out this one and see what it looks like." And start thumbing through it and see if they've got all the documents that they're supposed to have to be able to judge the risk of that particular loan. Well, if, if it doesn't necessarily work out too well that time, they'll make you go through every single one afterwards. Mm. Okay. Yeah, a little, if, 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 the if they catch check, something. If the spot check doesn't work, then they'll make you go through every single one. I mean, if the spot check doesn't if, work, they'll like what? If the spot check doesn't work out and you fail like a file or two oh, files yeah, or something right. like that, they'll make you 
Right. Then you might, yeah, you'll, you'll, they'll start saying, well, this one kind of sucked. If the rest of this drawer stinks as bad as this one, you guys are in trouble. And, yeah, and they might come back for future visits and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Is that right? So you were actually going through the file? Did you ever do it at the bank you were, were at? I mean, not personally, but that's kind of, like, yeah. they went through some quality issues, I guess, with um, some loan documents. So even uh, speaking back to this one, that's part of what the, they can prove up to say from a management perspective. We have an employee that uh, uh, half of her job is to thumb through the files on a regular basis or, you know, whatever. That, that can be a control measure up here in the M category that they can say, we have this in place. This is, we just don't kind of throw it in a file drawer and hope that the loan officer got everything. So. And then they just had like 30 temps in a room after that because, you know, uh, I forget what who was actually. Just done. bringing temps to do the same thing. To, yeah, Here's a checklist, go through every file, make sure every single one of these documents are in the file. Yep. Okay, so that gives us a little feel for that. I want to come back as we have so often and we'll continue to do to our old adverse selection and uh, moral hazard issues. And so having these audits and regulations, these, these banks are really one of the most heavily regulated uh, industries. Um, one argument is from an adverse selection issue. Um, it kind of keeps those risk loving entrepreneurs maybe away from wanting to become a banker. So that's kind of an interesting one to think about. So banks are a business, and they're like, oh, I want to make money. Hey, maybe I should just own a bank because they like control money and stuff. That'd be pretty cool. But then you get these risk-loving individuals, perhaps, that want the freedom to be, oh, I got some great ideas. We can make a lot of money if we leverage this and we take on this risk, right? So if we get into these riskier activities, it might put the bank uh, in jeopardy. And so um, one argument here is that the heavy regulation that is in place with audits kind of keeps away people of that mentality. Like, oh man, that would suck. I'm not, I want the freedom. I don't want to be answering to the government audit every three months or whatever. So I'm not even going to get into the banking business. And so there's, that's from an adverse selection point, which is, what's the key point? Adverse selection versus moral hazard? before contract, right? So that we, we don't attract, without regulation in place, we might tend to attract those sorts of individuals when it might not be ideal for banks. John? Is, but is that necessarily a, a huge issue? Because I, mean, I remember when we read in chapter nine, one of the first things it said is that right before financial crisis, almost every time you get financial innovation. Uh, and so then you then have the boom of capital and then runs out bust, et cetera. So I guess my the counter argument to that is, is that wouldn't that kind of, you know, steering away some riskier individuals into different practices, wouldn't that kind of more likely stabilize the financial system? That, that it would stabilize. Yeah. I mean, that's the argument, yes. But um, I, I think what you're bringing up is that it, it might not be the perfect solution because then we – shove those people into investment banking and then they figure out creative ways to make these super complicated products that nobody understands that they can make a ton of money on and then eventually Crash. the thing crashes because we don't regulators didn't understand all the implications of that a lot of hidden risk or whatever so but i think for the most part the argument is correct that it would probably tend to keep people out of out of the um, that particular industry they might still seep in through the cracks uh, a little more indirectly. All right, so um, risk-loving risk -loving entrepreneurs are less likely. They still might want to take a stab at it, but less likely to want to be in banking. A little too much friction. So once a bank has its charter, then 
moral hazard kind of addresses people from getting into too risky of stuff so that we have uh, things on the books. And so some of the things they can do goes beyond fines and fees. So um, one of them, let's go ahead and list that one first, fines and fees. But monetary penalties might not be uh, uh, the thing that deters uh, people. They just kind of make that calculated um, uh, argument, like some of the, you had uh, spatial economics where the rational thief just says, oh, well, let's see, I stand to gain $10 million with the probability of being caught of 10%. So 90% times $10 million equals this. The fine's only $5 million. Let's do it. Right? So fines and fees might not be enough to deter that. And so they also have some powers of cease and desist. So they can come in and say, stop doing this, whatever that activity is. Not just say, we're going to fine you a couple hundred bucks because you did that. And another thing they can do is force loan write-offs. tell them to get in bed, they already are, but they, they try to, they've been trying to bed them for, for a long time. But what does this do to the balance sheet? What's the issue here if they have a loan that says, you know what, you gotta, you gotta write this thing off. Yeah, so their assets go down, and then what happens up here? It goes down, forcing you possibly to have to put in your own money into the bank. Now, the banker on the other side says, what, this Russ McCullough guy, he's rock solid. Man, that loan, I know he hasn't paid for the last three months, but he's got this new thing coming in. I don't know, he's building some building, and, and somebody said they were going to pay him eventually. He's got this big payment he promises to pay with the tax return coming in April 15th. You know, promise, promise, promise. And the feds can say, no, you're writing it off. So they can force them to take it off. Even if I ultimately come through, which of course I always do, no, but uh, even if I ultimately come through, the them being forced to write it off caused them to have to inject capital, and so that's kind of a power there that uh, these audits. Have. Okay, any questions on that? Um, it, it would be more of a bank thing. I, there's, there's not too much jail time here unless there can be tied to personal behavior and personal gain where it's really stealing like, like a thief would go out and do. But if it's uh, the banks just not quite following, following the rules, then they're just forcing shutdown that they'll go out of business. So it's less, less criminal at this level. It's, it's not criminal. Or it, if they do find criminal activity, then it takes it to the probably the different department, a different agency would step in if they're, if they're having to look at that. And they certainly do turn up stuff like that. Okay, so um, after the camels audit, so after camels, a uh, bank gets put into a category. Bank gets grouped into one of five categories. So number one, the prime category, if you're a group one, so these are literally the names, it's just group ones through five, you exceed <coughs> minimum capital. So you are well capitalized. You are sitting fat on some cash. Number two is still good too. You are adequate. Which means you might meet the minimum 
Um, for the most part, sometimes you're a little fat, but you're fine. <clears throat> Number three is undercapitalized. So you fail to meet the minimum, which means you're going to have to crank in some cash after your audit. And then number four and five are bad news. Four is significantly undercapitalized. And number five is called dead meat. That's the rest of the interpretation. <laughs> It's called critical. Critical. Dead meat. <laughs> but I like dead meat. <laughs> <laughs> you got the you got the steak there. You got steak. Not so if you get to the if you get this is the purely I just made that up. So you guys know it. Nothing, nothing official. <laughs> I just don't understand. Like in, I like in general, the whole dead meat anywhere when people say dead meat, it's like, but you like dead meat. You like, you oh, dead meat. Meat. So if you are in the critical or otherwise known as dead meat category, um, if you're in this category, you might have some restrictions on interest that you can pay your deposits even. So. If you're in this category, the bet, one of the things that would help you is to attract deposits. And one way you can just say, hey, my bank's paying 5% interest. Come on over to me. You know, and people come because they have FDIC insurance. So if you're in this critical category, they might even say, no, you can't do that. The most you can offer your depositors is the going average. And they're, they're going to still uh, allow you to develop a plan to maybe work through it. They're not closing your doors at this point, but it's pretty... It's pretty serious. Uh, uh, real close, yeah. In some cases, it probably has led to that. But the more official term that the auditors are going to say is that this requires prompt corrective action. In other words, you can't just sit back in your big chair and hope that people are going to pay back their loans or bring in deposits you have to start acting and have a plan and submit that to them, you are in trouble. <clears throat> okay, so I got a short little video and then we'll, this is like a minute and 50 seconds long. And then we'll get into scousing. Resist this. This is actually a company. So, are you upset to know that we're potentially having to recover our school for the first quarter? Well, four. Okay, here we go. It's a short one, so be ready. It's a draw one, too. Thank you. 
Chase Bank Monitor today. For more information, or our full demo. All right, so comments on that little short video? As it relates to government regulation? What's that? This thing? This thing was a real thing, yeah. It kind of ties in, just to foreshadow a little bit, about where we're going with um, the next book we're going to look at. And here we've got a private company that's doing some of the same stuff that the government does. Right? It's kind of shadowing the camels, allowing people to monitor bank behavior on their own. So do we always have to you know, turn to the government for um, all of these monitoring issues, or are there other possibilities? So that's why I thought it was kind of a neat one to maybe take a look at. All right, so. Did you finish 11? No. No, we still got more 11. A little bit more. So let's talk Skousen. We're talking Vegas today, huh? All right, who wants to start us off here? Has Wall Street become another Las Vegas? Not so much. Jesse, I saw your post. Why don't you comment? I liked, I think, was it you or maybe it was somebody else? But what did you say on this? Why don't you start us off? Huh? What, what, what did you like in the <laughs> I think he said the opening quotes, and then he quickly went into how it's different or something. Oh, uh, I kind of liked how he was talking about his... Uh, Fellow uh, economic, yeah, economists, yeah, and like how they thought it was more family, but then it, it almost seemed like he was agreeing with them, and then he turned around and was like, "But it's not." Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I kind of started it off with uh, with his comments on uh, whether it is, and then here's why it's not, and kind of jumped in. I like the way you kind of characterize that on that part. Okay, what do you think? Who wants to start us off? I like where you point out the differences between the two. Just so you know, the, the main one I thought was that uh, in a casino, the odds are always against the player. In the stock market, the odds aren't always against you. That it, there is a way that you can make you know, your investments favorable. Yes. In a casino, there's nothing you can do. But in fact, like, like I said, with the exception of poker or whatever, but like, if you're in a slot machine, there's nothing you can do to increase your right. Yeah, who wants to add on to that? I think that's a good point, too. Anybody else comment on that one? He also talked about how there's not always a winner. Right. It's kind of like some people just win more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's different levels of winning is one argument to be made, right, is, is kind of part of it. Um, you maybe mentioned part of this, but long-term versus short-term comments on that. Long-term for Vegas, long-term for yeah. stock market, short-term for Vegas, short-term for stock market. I mean, you kind of mentioned, you know, long or short-term, Vegas, you're going to lose at some point. Um, but, you know, like if you, like in Vegas and the stock market, carelessly going at it for the short term and just like looking for you know quick money then the odds are you're probably going to lose in both places um, because you should invest your money and stay long term and that's kind of what he's been brought up all the time. So in that way is Vegas and Wall Street similar or different? Yeah. 
So in the in the short run, would you say there's more similarities? In the short term? Uh, yeah. Right. So yeah, I think that was an interesting analogy and, and, and probably true that it's more of a gamble is what we've learned with um, the efficient market hypothesis says that you can't predict for sure where, whether that stock price is going up or down very easily. It's, it's a random walk. There's a lot of noise of what it's going to look like 30 days from now. Well, you can go to the table and roll the dice, spin the wheel, you know, take the cards. And you would also have maybe similar odds would be the argument. So in the short term, Wall Street and Vegas can be very similar. That's kind of one of the main points we're driving at is that it is more of a gamble to be short-sighted in on Wall Street. But in the long term, it's much different. So who wins in the long term in Vegas? The house, yeah, every, and that's why they're doing it. And what's the argument to be made in the long term for the investor? You'll win, yeah. There's and it's a win-win, right? So, this whole win-loss thing. What's that econ term? The zero-sum game, right? So one person's wins is at the expense of somebody else. So, um, and in the stock market and in other forms of business, the wealth creation that goes on uh, creates these win-win opportunities. Okay. Good, good. Uh, How the so. that you mentioned the place, well, his take on how important the stock market was, saying that you know, the stock market is the beginning. He was talking about how some companies have talked about how it would be better for the stock market were just abolished. And later on page 53, he was talking about if it were actually abolished in major industrial nations, uh, it would likely provoke massive layoffs and depression as a source of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah, he made a pretty strong statement on on that. That uh, what was that? I thought I think I highlighted that too. <laughs> right. It's at least another another source of capital. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly a, a casino shutting down would, um, and they do in, in other parts. In fact, uh, it's kind of a big deal right now related to Ottawa since you brought it up. It was, I just happened to hear it on NPR this morning, which was kind of surprising. Um, Scott Walker up in Wisconsin uh, has somehow blocked or is blocking uh, a new casino being developed that is closer to Chicago than where the existing one is. Ottawa University, this is why it's personal to us, just developed a relationship with that casino that they will provide a free Ottawa education to the casino um, workers. They already do to the tribe. But we're, so this was kind of a neat deal for Ottawa. We're, they're paying, the company's gonna pay us, the casino's gonna pay us, but um, uh, Native American tribes are, are kind of very personal and relationship oriented and they just don't do that type of relationship with anybody and so it was part of our heritage at Ottawa University and what we've done 150 years blah 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 no the existing casino but if the new casino comes in part of what Scott Walker blocked it for and they've been lobbying up there for this reason too is that they would lose jobs since you brought up a casino going potentially either out of business or having to drastically reduce the size of what they are. And I think uh, the state must get tax revenue off of it. It must not all go to the tribe. Is, I don't know that for sure. I but the tribe can do. I mean, it was all tribal ground. 
I, I apparently with this one, maybe it was a deal that was struck later that the state gets some revenue. And so part of Scott, Scott Walker's argument was that if it cannibalizes one and it's kind of this quasi tax generator and it's going to lose jobs, why do it? So anyway, it, it was kind of an interesting story. Scott Walker is the, uh, what is he, the governor of, of Wisconsin. And he's the one that's been kind of market oriented, free market type stuff. So that's what kind of jumped out. He's not. Scott Walker's not related to Iowa. He's just the governor of the. So it's our deal with the tribe. But if that casino goes under, our deal probably goes under. So Ottawa University would probably like to see this blocking of the new casino as well from our own self-interest. So <laughs> What's that? So our tuition dollars are going to Wisconsin lobbyists. Uh, I don't know if it's that we don't need it that bad. This this actually this agreement was just struck with them, and it's a great deal. It's a great deal for them and us, but not to the point where we're gonna. I start blowing money up a, down the lobbyist pipeline, but <laughs> would be my guess. So, okay, other things on this chapter. I I did have one more. Oh, just a side highlight from the Potawatomi tribe. Every person when they turn 18 gets two million dollars. I think it's that much. I, that I met with one of the guys who's our liaison between the tribe, and it might be phased slightly, but from the tribe, and it's partly from these casino revenues that have been. And then they're into other businesses too. They started other tribe type businesses. So they are totally loaded. That's why they can afford, they're paying full rate for their Ottawa University education too. Yeah. And guess what they do? And guess what they do? It's gone in two years, he said. Almost 80, and he did have a statistic, but 80 to 85% of them, it's gone. Just gone. Party, new cars, trips, fun. Yeah, we have two. We have a tribal guy, my ex boyfriend, as soon as he turned 18, he um, got so much money, went off and bought a brand new truck, got it lifted, got it like everything. Mm -hmm. got a four wheeler just, just like, that's what he said it's unbelievable and, and actually we, I talked to him about doing personal finance type stuff that the these mm -hmm. tribal members really you, can you know them. even if they that's what I told him I said you know even if they took a million and just blew it they could have a lot of fun mm -hmm. and just leave the other million yeah, like <laughs> sitting in the long-term growth all the stuff we're talking about I mean, just take a million and go knock your socks out, but don't blow it all. They blow it all. It's oh, all gone. Possibly. It might. Yeah, it's kind of a recycling program of sorts. We have to <laughs> that could be. That could be. They don't make it All right. Other things on this gambling one. Oh, I thought it was kind of interesting at the end. Did you guys see about the gambler, that they were gamblers in their youth? Yeah. Some of that. I thought that was kind of an interesting comment. From some study that they did, that they were, they tend to like. Uh, I like the way they worded that too. Whether the game is poker, bridge, blackjack, or horses, it doesn't matter. What matters is the game itself. The essence of these games, the systematic weighing of risk against rewards, against mathematical probabilities, is the essence of business itself. I tend to agree with that. That way, you just kind of like that type of thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to call today there. We'll talk about uh, seven. Uh, obviously, you guys can read ahead to eight. We will finish eight by the end of the chapter, but. Nothing to do for Wednesday. Let's go ahead and knock out eight for Wednesday. There, it's another short chapter there, so much fun anyway. Um, I capstone homework, but I left it in the room. I can bring it to your office. But 
for some reason, I think the international version has different homework problems. Like the numbers are out of order because the solutions that you sent me did not match up to the problems. Well, why don't you bring that? I'll have to okay, look. Okay, yeah, because I, so I went ahead and just did two through five in my book. Did you have somebody else's book to double check with? Or? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. And I didn't have my um, laptop with me in Hayes, so I just wrote it all out on paper. Yeah. Um, oh, that's fine. Okay. So. Something doesn't seem really <laughs> close. I think it's good to kind of dig a little bit that way. So. I'm a little hesitant.